Pentecostal Baptist Church, Roanoke, Texas. What a joy and a privilege it is for us to know that you who are joining with us, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. We hope that you pray for this ministry as we pray for you. And we look forward to what God has each midweek. We're studying under the major heading of practical Christianity. In other words, how do, how do we practice our Christianity in a practical in a practical and everyday walk with God? And uh, for the last few times that we've met, we've looked at some different subjects of practical Christianity. And uh, the reason it's important, ladies and gentlemen, because our life is represented by the choices that we make. Do you know I am who I am, as you are, by the choices we make? And so those choices need to be under the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So I ask you to turn with us this evening to Philippians 4, 10 through 13. And our study tonight will be choose contentment over comparison. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and know, know how to bow everywhere in all things. And I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But here's the victory. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Choosing contentment over comparison. You know, as I said, most of our life is defined by choices. So the challenge is for us to choose contentment over comparison. Because comparison causes us to be discontent, unhappy, and judgmental. People are discontented with their jobs and employees are discontented with their workers. Husbands and wives discontented with one another, keeping the divorce courts filled with such cases. Families are destroyed because parents are discontent with their children. Children feel the same way toward their parents. It's true in the business world, politics, sports perhaps, but the greatest tragedy of all is the local New Testament church. You see, the challenge for us as individuals and as a church is to choose contentment over comparison. You see, discontentment comes because of the emphasis we put on what we have instead of <coughs> who we are. So let's look at what contentment is not. It's not complacency, smug and uncritically satisfied the oneself for one's achievements. To be complacent, one is satisfied with self. It carries the idea of no longer caring about what happens. It means to resign or give up in life. And you see it's not the nature of sinful man to be content. Listen to me. It's not natural. For the natural or unsaved man. Or even the believer who is out of the will of God. To be content. With what they have. They're always searching for what they think will bring about 
contentment. But contentment is something we must learn. <laughs> Verse 11 in our text, not that I speak in respect of want. Now look at here. For I have learned and here's what contentment is. In whatsoever state period of my life, situation in my life, trials in my life, tragedies in my life, wherever I am, whatever's taking place, I have learned therewith to be content. Now, let me give you a major part of what I'm trying to say tonight. Contentment can only be learned by practice and what we experience. By practice and what we experience. You see, it's not having everything that we think we might enjoy. I want you to go back to the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. And Solomon wrote this. The wisest man at that particular time. And whatsoever mine eyes desire, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Hello, society today. Thinking. Thinking. By not being denied whatever we desire, whatever we want, if we have the portion we think we deserved as far as the wage of our labor, but then I want you to look at verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. Uh-oh. Here's what causes burnout. Here's what causes discontent. Here's what causes self-destruction. Look at it. Look at it. Or listen to it. Then I looked on all the works my hands had wrought and on labor that I had labored to do. Behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And then there was no profit under the sun or there was no contentment. Unless we learn to be content with what we have, we never can rest. We never can enjoy what we have, but we're always trying to motivate ourselves to have more, 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 more. And all more does is cause us to continue to want more. Well, preacher, you don't we need to profit and we don't need to expand. No, I didn't say that. But when that becomes your total, total, Desire in life. The Bible said the root of all evil is money. Now money's not evil. But when it becomes a man or a woman's God. Of which money is one of the most popular gods of current society. Got to have more, 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 more. You see Solomon learned by practice. And knew by experience that satisfaction and contentment cannot be found in things. I read a little article. I want you to get this now. Listen carefully. There was a grave marker that a man observed 
with this inscription on it. She died for the want of things. He died trying to give them to her. That's life. That's life. Look at Ecclesiastes 5.10. He that loveth silver shall never be satisfied with silver. Nor he that loveth abundance with increase, this is also vanity. You can't buy contentment. And the lesson you have to learn in order to have contentment is, and before you can profit and enjoy that profit, you've got to first of all be content with what you have at this moment and praise God for it. The Bible said in Matthew 6.33, Seek you the kingdom of God in His righteousness. Get saved. Live for God. And the quality of living for God is gratitude and thanksgiving. For the Bible said He withholds nothing from Him that walks upright. And so many people today do not have profit in life, and I'm not just talking about money, or people never get to enjoy the profit life has brought them because they've never learned to be thankful and appreciate whatever part of life is, God's in control. He promised that if they were saved and, and living for Him, He said, all these things let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You'll never enjoy anything until you remember all good things come from the Father. James chapter 1. All good gifts come down from the Father in heaven. And the reason people... And listen to me. That which God gives you, if you appreciate then it's in the safekeeping of God. Or you may have a natural talent. You may go out. In fact, the Bible affirms to us that some people could gain the whole world in the sense of being the richest and the most famous and things of that nature. But why as they do, why do they die discontent? I mean, they're walking on ice that they might lose it. Think about it. Think about it. You see, what is contentment? What is contentment? Contentment comes from within and not from without. Look at verse 11 again. In whatsoever state, that's the condition of the heart. See, circumstances was not the rule or the leadership in Paul's life. You see, the word contentment comes from the word containment, which describes a person who is self-contained. Someone who has learned to derive satisfaction from his or her inner resources rather than from external resources. Here is the way not to lose contentment. Go to Colossians 3.2. Set your affection on things above, of which you cannot lose. See, don't you remember where the Bible said, send your treasures on to heaven, where neither rust nor moth nor thieves break in and steal? People talk about a secure bank, a secure safe, a secure deposit box. Let me tell you, there is no security in this life but Jesus Christ. 
And this is not the lesson tonight, but if you're paying any attention, you better pay attention to how close you are to losing a whole lot of materialistic things. But that which you send ahead, look at it. Look at it. Contentment comes from within and not from without. In whatsoever state I am, you see, set your affection on things, Colossians 3, 2, above. Neither rust nor corruption. Our thieves break in to steal. It's in the very security of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. Jesus affirms us even when he was walking up on this ground. He never loses. Never has lost. Somebody said he lost it. Judas. No. Judas was the son of perdition. He never had him. You can't take something away from the Lord they never had. But how many people have turned to drugs, even committed suicide, because they built their contentment on what they had and what they were continuing to grow in materialistically? Do you know that you have nothing in this life Nothing in this life but your eternal soul if it's in Jesus Christ that you can keep. Life could determine to take any and everything. And you have knowledge of that. Think about it. It's not a result of having great wealth but having few wants. You see, contented folks are satisfied with their lot in life while others are never satisfied no matter what they have. Why are they satisfied? Look at Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You see, contentment is not having everything we want but is enjoying everything we have. So how can we be content? Well, we read it in our text in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. From these verses, we read Paul's example. His contentment was Jesus Christ is a complete control. I have no need that he won't meet. I have no protection that he can't provide. I'm in the safest and most secure position in all of life. Because I've claimed Matthew 6, 33. He sought Christ, found him. He began to walk in his righteousness of Christ by faith and obedience and therefore all that he needed was prepared and presented by Christ he said he was content because he rejoiced in the Lord for how good and gracious he was but he also admitted it was not natural he had to learn contentment whether he was abounding or based whether he was full or was hungry, whether he was suffering a need or having his needs met. Paul, as we must center our life around Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about that. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. You see, the Word of God instructs us the blessings of being content. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. 
See, listen to me. You get that spiritual person obeying and serving God and the Spirit of God will bring about that believer's desire to be content with however God is moving in his or her life. And it can't be shaken. Paul tells us also, he had learned in Romans 8, 28, but all things happen for good according to the purpose of God. He didn't say they were good. You see, with our knowledge of God's word, with our service to the Lord, with the amount of time we spend in prayer, with our level of giving unto the work of God through our church and missionary outreach, with the number of people we are reaching with the gospel. Now, what's the biggest disaster that robs contentment greater than anything else? Satan used it on Mother Eve and is still active. That is comparing with other people what they have, how they're being blessed, or where they are in popularity. But you know, in Corinthians, the Bible teaches us Paul emphasizes the membership of the body of Christ as in the physical body. Everybody's not a heart. Everybody's not an eye. But Paul teaches us that every part of the human body is content to do its part until disease or injury sets them back. It's the same way in the spiritual life when we begin to think. And you know what caused Eve to lose her contentment? When Satan said, well, that's, that's right. I mean, God's give you this. But he didn't give you the best. He has to give you the right to know good and evil, which God had to. God had told them on the day they eat the fruit, they'd surely die. And what he's doing in the world today, and that's why we have so many people crying out, I deserve this, I deserve this. Look, he has it, she has it. There's no such thing, ladies and gentlemen, ever possible in this life called equality. Everybody's not going to be rich. Everybody's not going to be poor. Everybody's not going to be smart. Every people's not going to lack. Every people's not going to have more than they can handle. And when you begin to compare your life with somebody else, and the devil begins to tell you, well, look at them. They're not even trying to serve God. They just go about and do what they want. Looks like everything just pours out from heaven for them. Let me give you a clue about that. Go read Psalm 73. And you'll come to the same conclusion David did. Oh, he felt that way. He became discontent because he looked and compared his life with the others. He was going through a trying time. He knew people that wasn't even trying to do what was right. Nothing's happened to them. It looked like there were some people who had the Midas touch. Everything they touched turned to gold. And he lost his contentment. And then he began to complain against God. And when you're complaining against God, you never know that you've lost your contentment, your faith, and your trust in him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But Satan's a master at it. Look over there. Look how much finer car they drive. Look how much finer house they live in. Look how much finer clothes they wear. And it seems like they just have the money to do whatever they want to. And here I am. It would appear to me I'm fighting to survive. Well, 
that's the wrong attitude because the Lord said in Matthew 6, 33, if you're right with him, you've got no worry. He promised to take care of everything. So evidently, you're not living for God like you ought to because worry has come upon you. Fear has begun to infiltrate you and you've become discontented. It's the same way in a relationship. Well, look how he treats his wife. Well, my husband don't treat me that way. Look how she loves him. And the man comes up here and says, well, mine don't love me that much. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Every one of us is an individual. My heart cannot do the work of a kidney. I'm not supposed to compare with what some other families doing, what some other couples doing, what some other individuals doing. Do you know, here's a shame, and I'll share it, and I'm ashamed to share it. It's wiped out more preachers than anything because comparing one for another, how come he's being blessed and I'm not? How come he's building a church and I can't even hold one together? Because the Bible says God has a plan for every individual and it's not the same. God is working in your life according to his plan. Stop looking at the outward illustration of other people. Nobody can be you. Nobody can do what you can do. And God only asks you to do one thing. One thing. Be faithful. Do the best you can where you are with the talent and the spiritual power that God gives you. Because there will be people that we compare to was really all for show. And if we had followed their example, they may have been one of those false preachers or one of those false teachers. And the Bible tells us very plainly to envy no one. Now this is not bragging, but let me show you something, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody can be me but me. Nobody can be you but you. And God didn't call me in your place or you he didn't call in my place you'll never find an eye that can do the work of a heart but look how the body's hindered if there was a competition between them stop trying to be anybody but who jesus christ is creating do the best that you can with where you are with the leadership of the Holy Spirit and praise God for this he's using you he's using you thank God my kidneys are working thank God I can see thank God I can walk or whatever all oh, that which has destroyed more people is getting into the rule. Do you know why a lot of people are in debt today? Well, they got it. I want it. They're ahead of me, so I've got to jump ahead. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Be content with who you are, where you are, with what you have, and allow God to use it for His glory and you'll have a peace that passes all understanding. Remember what Jesus said? I give you peace. And I'm going to tell you, there's so many people in debt today trying to keep up with other people and trying to run the same race that they're not even enlisted in the race, that they've destroyed their worthwhile for the cause of Christ. They can't serve Him regularly. They can't give to the cause of Christ. Listen to me. Listen to me contentment it's up to you and you must be willing to learn and through the experience so let me say to you in closing if you do not know Christ as your Savior you will never 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 know true contentment oh you'll have a, a little high through life and pew, crash crash you know what contentment is? Look at Daniel. Look at the three Hebrew children. Look at the Apostle Paul. See, it was not what they had. 
It was who God was making them. It was who God was bringing them to the place that they could glorify him. Think about it. Think about it. You see, the choice is ours to be content with who God is creating that we can bring glory to him or we can look over here and say, God's unfair to me. Look at him. Look at her. How could they be blessed of God like they are and getting what they have when I know personally they're not even trying? Go read Psalm 73. And when David saw the truth, it forever changed him. Because remember this, ladies and gentlemen, all the suffering that a believer has to do is now. That's all. Because one day we'll be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And in the presence of our precious, precious, precious Savior, we shall never have a want or a need or a problem for all eternity. And then we would complain and gripe about how little suffering. And the Bible said, if we're not willing to suffer with Christ, we'll not reign with him. If you're not willing, and he said, those that would follow me would suffer. Oh, listen to me. Learn to be content. That don't mean you don't have a, a desire to, to move up or to, to get a, a better standard of living but never let it take you if God doesn't will for you to do that don't let it sour you on the Lord there's an old saying let's look for instance at tithing if you'll tithe God can take the remainder and make it tremendously and expand it but if you withhold it, no matter how much you make, you'll never get ahead. Think about it. Father, if there's anything that condemns us today, it's the lack of contentment. We become selfish, self-centered, comparing one with another, trying to outdo, out-have everybody else and we wound up doing nothing but make a mess we've destroyed family we've destroyed government we've destroyed education most of all we're destroying our witness for the lord jesus christ all that's required of me lord is to be faithful to be faithful nothing else and sometimes it might be to be unknown, to not have everything in this world, to be unrecognized, but constantly every day asking for the wisdom and the discernment and the leadership to bring glory and honor to the Father, to lift up Christ and touch somebody else is the greatest rewards of being content help us to lay down that stop being jealous and especially stop comparing one with another because that's a bad compar comparison remember all we're doing is one sinner looking to another sinner yet we can have victory as a sinner looking to a savior let us look at him let us obey him let us love him in his lovely name we ask Amen. God bless you. Be set free and stop looking and judging your life by what somebody else is or has. If you want to be like somebody, be like Jesus. In his name I pray.